Welcome, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us on today's uh, introduction to uh, President Franklin Roosevelt's model for a national infrastructure bank. We still have folks coming into the uh, call, uh, but we'll go ahead and get started. And uh, just to let you know, this uh, presentation is being recorded and will be posted on our webpage, nibcoalition.com, so that uh, if you missed it or missed part of it, you can go back and uh, view it there. My name is Alfeka Mutardi. I am a macroeconomist. I worked for 25 years at the International Monetary Fund. Now I'm the lead economist on this National Infrastructure Bank proposal and also on the NIB board. Today we have, we're really, really lucky to have Stephen Fenberg with us. Uh, who's written extensively about the Reconstruction Finance Corporation. That was the last time we had a bank modeled on a big off-budget uh, way to finance our infrastructure needs. Uh, uh, Stephen has been executive producer. He was executive producer of the Emmy award-winning documentary, Brother, Can You Spare a Billion?, which was narrated by Walter Cronkite and broadcast nationally on PBS. He's also the author of this wonderful book, Unprecedented Power, uh, which lays out in detail uh, all the, the nuts and bolts of the RFC, the Reconstruction Finance Corporation, uh, and how it uh, built America and got us out of the Great Depression and helped us to win World War II. This is a really big concept and we want to repeat it today because we really have another bank like this. So Stephen's going to give you a presentation on the RFC, how it worked then, how it can work today. And then I'm going to follow it up with a little bit of the economic point of view, what it will do for the economy, the average American worker, uh, and improve our uh, conditions, uh, rebuild our country from the bottom up like it did once before. So with that, I'll turn it over to Stephen. Thank you very much, Stephen, for joining us. Really great to see you again. Go ahead and make your presentation. Thank you, Alfeca. It's always a pleasure to be here to talk about a new national infrastructure bank modeled on the Reconstruction Finance Corporation, which essentially saved the United States economy during the Great Depression and expanded it. Uh, then turned its attention from domestic economics to global defense and militarized industry in time to fight and win World War II. So I'm going to start my talk today off with a slogan, since this is the season of slogans. And I think that a new national infrastructure bank, and here's the slogan, can electrify the USA. We need to electrify the USA just like the Reconstruction Finance Corporation did back in the 1930s, when only 20% of the people living in rural America had power. The rest of them were living in the dark. So the RFC was the nation's lending institution. It was not a spending agency. And that's really the important distinction between all the New Deal agencies we might be familiar with. The RFC was the nation's lending agency. And what it did to electrify the United States like we need to do today when we're worrying about our grids and how do we get all the electricity that we need to power all the new technologies that we're dealing with today. Back then, the RFC made loans to utility companies. They established electric co-ops. They made loans to municipalities to help build the infrastructure that would bring electricity to remote rural areas, just like we need to do today with broadband. So it made these loans to build this infrastructure. It brought power to remote areas, and then it helped people who were cash strapped because it was the Great Depression by appliances so they could plug into the modern age. Then it created what was called the Electric Home Farm Authority. I bring up these two agencies, the REA, the Rural Electrification Administration and the EHFA because they are so relevant to today. The EHFA allowed, let's say, a farmer to go into a Main Street store and buy a refrigerator, a water pump, a fan, a radio, and the RFC would reimburse the appliance store for those appliances. And the utility company that was selling the power to these new customers would add a little bit 
in their monthly bill to repay the RFC plus interest, which was then forwarded back to the RFC. The RFC by about 1943 had helped over a million families buy appliances so they could use this new power that had just come into their lives. And by 1943, the program was disbanded. It was no longer needed, which is a great feature of the RFC. Once was something was past its useful life, it was stopped. It was terminated. It was not there in perpetuity. Uh, but by 1943, the EHFA had helped more than a million families buy appliances, and it even made a little profit for the United States government. The RFC became the world's largest corporation and its biggest bank. And ironically, it was started by a Republican president, Herbert Hoover, who by 1932, the last year of his administration, realized that the federal government was the only institution large enough and powerful enough to arrest the catastrophe of the Great Depression. By the time he left office and Roosevelt took over, all the banks in the United States were closed. The economic system had completely collapsed. Unemployment was 25 percent. Industrial output had dropped by half and stocks had lost 75 percent of their value. People were eating grass to stay alive and burning their furniture to stay warm. Suicide rates tripled during that time. It was a, 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 an, an amazingly difficult and challenging time in the United States history. Hoover had started the RFC and he had a bipartisan board and one of its members, Jesse Jones, I wrote his biography, uh, would later say that he gave credit to Herbert Hoover for starting the RFC. He said, but it was entirely too timid and slow. And I'm saying this because it's so relevant today as we grapple with the role of government now. He said if two to three billion dollars had been judiciously loaned in 1931 and 1932, the catastrophe of the Great Depression would mostly have been avoided. The collapse in agriculture and industry would not have happened if we had just embraced the power of good government and made these loans a year or two before Hoover established the RFC in 1932. Roosevelt kept the RFC. He didn't disband it because it had been started by a different administration and a different party. He saw the value of it. And he knew Jesse Jones would be the person to put in charge of it because Jesse Jones was an avowed capitalist. He was Houston's preeminent developer during the first half of the 20th century. And he understood <laughs> the value of credit, that credit was needed to get the frozen wheels of the economy to turn again. The first thing the RFC did yeah. was to buy preferred stock in banks so that they would be recapitalized and could lend again. Yeah. The RFC bought preferred stock in banks to recapitalize them so they could lend again. Jesse Jones understood credit was needed to get the wheels of the economy to turn again. Uh, the Troubled Asset Relief Program, TARP, in 2008 copied what the RFC did during the Great Depression, only Jesse Jones called it the bank repair program. The trouble was with the with the program, the bank repair program, the bankers wouldn't lend this fresh cash. They were afraid. They were shell-shocked. And Jesse Jones and Roosevelt said to these bankers, he said, if you don't make loans to get the economy to turn again, the RFC will have to become the lender of last resort, which is what happened. And that's when it really took off. The RFC made loans to help people, thousands of people save their homes, farms, banks, and businesses. It financed the development of high-speed rail. It built bridges, tunnels, aqueducts, and highways. It made money while doing all these things, which is, I think, one of the most important features of the RFC and what we need to be looking at today. So I, I started by talking about the Rural Electrification Administration and the EHFA. And here's why I think that it's so important to look at those two agencies, because they are models for today as we want to spread 
broadband access across the nation as we need to help people modify their homes so they're storm resistant, energy efficient, and wired for the modern age. The EHFA and the REA are perfect models for those efforts. And both of those agencies helped millions of people. They brought electricity to remote areas. And once again, it made money for the U.S. Treasury and for taxpayers at the same time. This was the nation's infrastructure bank at its best. And these programs were really working. By 1936, after FDR's first four years in office, unemployment dropped 8%. Detroit was producing more cars in 1936 than it had in 1929, and industrial output doubled. But also during this time, war was spreading through Europe, and the United States was completely unprepared. We rank 17th in the world in terms of size of our, our military. Hard to believe now. But there, Roosevelt had an extra quiver in his, his basket, so to speak, because the public was completely opposed to intervention unless the United States was, complete, was attacked. And the United States Congress had passed neutrality acts, which forbid the United States to sell arms to warring nations. But Roosevelt could turn to Jesse Jones and the RFC to begin militarizing industry. 1940, Congress passed legislation that allowed the RFC to build, buy, or modify plants to start manufacturing the airplanes, tanks, trucks, that were ships that were needed to fight and win World War II. And its efforts were comprehensive. It not just built these plants. For instance, Roosevelt wanted 50,000 new airplanes built a year. At the beginning, we only had 2,500, and they were antiquated and left over from World War I. But Roosevelt said, we need 50,000 airplanes a year to be manufactured. The RFC jumped in, started building these airplanes but it also established schools to train aviators so that the planes could be flown. And it also started manufacturing high octane gasoline. It cornered the market in silk for parachutes and wool for uniforms. And I, again, I say all this because these efforts were comprehensive and massive. And we can do those same things today if we will only embrace the power of good government and not see it as our enemy. Or as Jesse Jones said in 1937 about economic recovery, it will not happen unless we, if we continue to think that our government is our enemy. So I think that's the main ingredient to establishing a new infrastructure bank that can help everybody, that can rebuild United States. We need to embrace the power of good government as something that's patriotic. And the RFC operated in a goldfish bowl. It was transparent. Jesse Jones was on the radio and newspapers all the time talking about what the RFC was doing. And he always cited three numbers, how much the RFC had loaned, how much had been returned, and how much they had to spend, use to fund Roosevelt's spending programs like the uh, WPA, the Works Progress Administration, for instance. Jesse Jones was always a little miffed about that because he really saw lending as the way to address our critical problems and was always a little reluctant about, you know, devoting some of the profits of the RFC to the spending programs, which also did help in recovery. But this is all to say the Reconstruction Finance Corporation offers a great model for today to see how we can implement these same successful strategies that worked so well in the past that allowed the United States to emerge from the Great Depression and expand the economy while doing so, and then convert from domestic economics to global defense in time to fight and win World War II. I think one of, just like the EH. EHFA and the REA from the Great Depression are worth looking at today. Also, the initiative to develop synthetic rubber from the lab to mass production 
18 months before the attacks on Pearl Harbors is so significant and so relevant today. The way we amassed and acquired strategic materials from around the world or just manufactured our own, like magnesium, aluminum, steel. We built the first tin smelter in the Western Hemisphere in order to build all the tanks and planes and ships that were required to fight and win World War II. But the RFC orchestrated the development of synthetic rubber from the lab to mass production by assembling academics, industrial leaders, and scientists to sit down and figure out how can we pool patents to make this happen. And it was just in time because the Japanese took over our supply of natural rubber, which was what we mainly used at the time. And they had these synthetic rubber plants up and going in time to address that situation. I bring it up because today we need rare earth minerals. We need so many different things that are required for our cell phones, for batteries. You name it, you can look at the RFC, see how it addressed these critical issues during these times, and we can apply those same strategies today. But the main thing is we must embrace the power of good government in order to do so. And I'll stop there and I'll turn it over to Alfeca and, and open it up to any questions anybody might have. Thank you so much, Stephen. What an excellent presentation. You really set up a, a vision for what this National Infrastructure Bank can do today. And I really, really appreciate that. So I'd like to talk yeah. a little bit about the economic aspects of, of both the old bank and the new one as well, and the differences and similarities between the uh, economies back then and today also. So um, if you compare the economies of 1933, 1940, getting it going into the war with today's 2024 economy, you do see some differences. First of all, the economy back then had high unemployment uh, as a result of the Great Depression. The banks were closed, uh, um, all the manufacturing, you know, centers were shuttered. Uh, so unemployment was the, the, the driving force for how the RFC was applied initially to get people back to work. Uh, today's in today's economy uh, is a little different. We have where our economy is growing, albeit slowly. Uh, we're coming out of an inflationary period. Uh, and um, so we don't necessarily have unemployment. But one, one thing we do have is high cost of housing and uh, the inflation impact has really, even though people are working, they're really not doing well. So those are a couple of big differences on the, the economies back then and today. But one big similarity that you see in the numbers is record income inequality. If you take everybody's salary, put it together in a big pot, and then calculate how much of that total salary is going to the top 1% of income earners. Back then, just before the, the market crashed in 1929, it was some 25% of all that income went to the top 1%. Today, it is nearly at that same level. So we have huge income inequality uh, and what the wealthy do with their income is a, a secondary question, but we have rising homelessness, food insecurity, huge dissatisfaction with government policies. So when you say we have to embrace the, uh, you know, the record of the um, RFC and good governance, uh, one way to do that is to have a new infrastructure bank, which solves this basic economic problem. Another second uh, huge similarity is running big budget deficits. Today, uh, in this last year, our budget deficit ran 1.8 trillion. Uh, we're, our debt, total debt is approaching 36 trillion. Interest on the debt is now above defense spending, and there is no money in the budget to invest in the economy, none. So what we need is an off-budget entity to uh, to take over this, this role. And our manufacturing sector is really gutted. Uh, back in the day, businesses were shuttered during the depression, but today the problem is uh, that the financial sector, which banks are lending, but they're only lending for 
financialization things. They're not lending into the real economy. They are not investing in the real economy. There's no money in the budget to do that. And so as a result, our manufacturing sector has been gutted and uh, all of it's been sent uh, abroad. So uh, how did the RFC do that? Of course, you've already talked about this money was scarce during the depression. Uh, the RFC financed big ticket items like uh, building dams, big complicated um, um, projects like the Hoover Dam, the Tennessee Valley Authority. And how did it do that with a workforce that was just coming off of unemployment? Um, I hope you talk a little bit about that in the Q&A period, but essentially what they did was they hired up everybody. They just said, go out and put up you know, um, jobs wanted signs everywhere and tr attract these people in, even if they're low skill workers, what we're gonna do is put them to work right away. And then we're gonna train them in the evenings in schools and on the weekends so that they become more um, you know, um, technical at their jobs and their work. Uh, this really, these big, big ticket uh, projects really exploded economic growth and productivity. Uh, GDP growth averaged 5% per year over the period of the Reconstruction Finance Corporation, 1933 to 57. That's a huge increase in uh, growth. Our growth lately in the United States has been only about 1.8%. And if we can double that with investments uh, by a national infrastructure bank, uh, we'll, that's how we bring in more revenues into the government and dramatically increase tax receipts that are coming into the government. You talked about lending into poor areas. This is really the ticket and the way to go. And to show you that all these loans were paid back, uh, that everybody told uh, Jesse Jones and, our, and FDR, don't lend for electrification in those areas. Those farmers won't be able to pay you back. And indeed, their productivity on their farms rose dramatically. And um, some of these rural electrification cooperatives are still around today. Uh, and uh, all the loans were paid back. So uh, that's a, another example. So. How do we apply this in today's world? We have a bill in Congress, the uh, National Re Infrastructure Bank Act of 2023. It's uh, bill, current bill number is HR 4052. What this bill does is it creates an off-budget bank to lend for infrastructure projects all across the country. That's what we need. We can't do it through the budget. So we need an off-budget entity to make these loans. Currently, we have a lot of momentum on our bill. Currently, we have 42 co-sponsors on the bill, including the main sponsor, Rep. Danny Davis from Chicago, Illinois. We have brought on at least four members of Congress just since the uh, Democratic National Convention in Chicago. Uh, there's This has a lot of legs. P members of Congress have realized that we can't do this adequately through the budget. The bipartisan infrastructure law was a great start, but not enough to cover everything. And so what are the everything that we wanna cover? What is the, What are the things we wanna build uh, with, with this infrastructure bank? It's everything that needs fixing and people need, okay? Uh, the American Society of Civil Engineers uh, identified 16 categories uh, that we can rebuild and repurpose for which we transportation systems, water system, the power grid. I'm going to talk about that a little bit more. And then we also know that we all, we must have a high-speed rail network around the country. And we link that with tr train stations and passenger rail, more rail in our transportation mix. Broadband everywhere. Of course, uh, this will have big productivity gains in the same way that uh, investing in electrification in the rural areas did before. Affordable housing, we have a huge housing crisis right now. Uh, people are housing insecure, that's making their life everything insecure. And uh, we, uh, we have a low stock of housing and we need to build that up. And then large scale water projects in areas where we grow our nation's food. So all those things are the National Infrastructure Bank will invest in. And back to the future, we wanna rebuild our electric grid uh, to provide uh, uh, electricity for everything, including electrification. This will really supercharge the American economy. It's off budget, directs the investment, is a source of organizing all of these infrastructure bank improvements. And then we want to, that it will fundamentally promote long-term growth and better paying jobs. We'll be taking people not off of bread lines, but into uh, off of uh, low paying service jobs and into these 21st century uh, technical jobs uh, with the National Infrastructure Bank. So uh, with all that, I will stop there and let's open this up to questions and answers. Uh, so if any of you have had any thoughts about this 
or questions or would like to make a comment, just please raise your hand and we can call on you. Uh, and we'll we'll go through them one by one. So thank you very much. So let's start with Don Sifkis in, uh, where are you at right now, Don, in, in California? California, yes, yeah, San Leandro. <laughs> he moves around. I, go yeah. ahead. Now, Dr. Thunberg, I, I can speak with some authority on the REA. My granddad's farm in Pickerel, Nebraska was electrified in 1942, and I have a living cousin on the other side of the family that still remembers that. Amazing thing. Now, I've read your book, and I've read most of Jesse Jones' own book, $50 billion, and it's really clear that the tremendous success of the RFC and the WPA depended on the personalities, basically, of three guys, Jesse Jones, Franklin Roosevelt, and Harold Ickes, the Secretary of the Interior. Who would you suggest could run this thing now? Because I am very concerned that even if we get this bill passed in Congress, who is there that can drive this thing. I'd really appreciate your comments on specific names that you think we could support to do this. You know, I wish I could give you a good answer. And I'm asked this almost every time. And you're right. Jesse Jones was one of the reasons why it was so successful. There was never a hint of scandal the whole time he was in, in charge of it, which was from 1933 to 1945. And you're right. It's essential that we have a person in charge who is has integrity, honesty, and a commitment to improving the common good. That's essential. And who that person might be, I wish I could tell you a name, but I don't really have one because I'm I can't say I'm in in that circle that I would know, oh, this one, that one, or the other one. You know, of course I think about Warren Buffett, uh, maybe Mitt Romney. I don't know. It's it's really a it's a tough nut to crack because it will take a person of integrity to and honesty to operate this massive institution and have control of such a huge amount of money. Um, I will say back to the RFC, they made loans to every single congressional district in the United States. I said earlier, they operated in a goldfish bowl. They were completely transparent about everything they did. Uh, and those are the things that I think are essential to today when we think about a new um, infrastructure bank. There was also no ideology associated with this bank. If you look at how it built the plants during World War II, it spent billions of dollars to build aviation, for instance. It invested 10 times more in aviation than the industry had invested in its entire history. And by war's end, the RFC, the federal government, owned 70% of the aviation industry. But it was never its intention to nationalize anything. It wanted to save democracy and capitalism. Those were the intentions of the RFC, of Franklin Roosevelt and Jesse Jones. They had started planning for reconversion well before the end of World War II so that they could sell all of this capacity back to the private sector, which is exactly what happened. And that is one of the reasons why the middle class expanded like it did after World War II, because the United States government had built this massive industrial capacity and sold it to the private sector. The synthetic rubber uh, initiative that I talked about, that was one of the last things that was sold because the government wanted to keep it uh, until after the Korean War. And Senator Lyndon Johnson was the person in charge of disposing of those plants. And like so many other things the RFC did, the sale of those plants, the sale of the rubber that it manufactured created a profit for the United States government. And when those plants were sold, the New York Times reported that the synthetic rubber initiative was second only to the atomic energy initiative. And I bring all these things up to say, we did it once, we can do it again, and we'll find the right person to run it. Thanks for your question. It's a long-winded answer, and I didn't really answer your question. I'm sorry. <laughs> I can't see who, regardless of who wins, Trump or Harris, I can't see either one of those two people understanding the importance of this thing. And it's just, it's very worrisome to me. All this work to get this thing passed, who, who's going to run it? You got to have a person at the top. You would be great running it, okay? I, but, oh, I thank know. you so much. 
I know. Anyway, thank you for answering. That's, no, that's, thank you for your question. And thank you for your comment about my book. That, that means a lot to me. Great question and answer. Thanks, Don. And I would add on that as regards transparency, these things are built into the bill, into the uh, NIB bill, uh, so that we will have, and then what will be lent for is also built into the bill. So there's no questions on that. We have a board of directors that decides on the loans. Uh, so we've turned as much over to the uh, design of the uh, NIB as we can uh, to make up for the fact that Essentially, the RFC did a lot of this by the seat of their pants, but they were totally correctly directed. Uh, and uh, we went, and so in the bill today, we wanted to make sure that we uh, do the same uh, thing uh, going forward. So thank you very much for that. Uh, so next, I'll call on Nelson Betancourt in Florida. Uh, yes, th thank you very much, uh, uh, Stephen. I I read your book, and I also saw your documentary. Great, thank you very much. Thank you. Very inspiring. Yes. Um, I have a question for uh, for the folks that are organizing the National Infrastructure Bank. The the present uh, bill, will that have to be renewed every year and start anew? Or how long can you hold on to those 43 so far um, co-sponsors? How does that work? I don't understand that part of the, the deal. Great. So the way that bills are arranged in Congress is they are submitted in each congressional period, which lasts for two years. So mm -hmm. we're in, currently in the 118th Congress. And in January, when a new House of Representatives is sworn in, we'll move into the 119th Congress and we'll have to resubmit the bill. Um, typically, uh, this is we've never had as many co-sponsors on our bill as we have at present. The same uh, uh, conditions apply uh, as as before. Um, not enough money in the budget to pay for things. Uh, so we're very confident that when we reintroduce it, even with a couple of new improvements on it, not, not nothing major, uh, that we'll be able to go back and re uh, get those same members of Congress re-signed up. Uh, that will be our def definite uh, um, objective for 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 the January period next year. Thank you. Okay, how about Jim Henley? Can I uh, see what you have to re to make a comment or a question? Yes, thank you very much, Alfeca. As usual, uh, these town halls are extremely informative. Uh, and uh, one of the things that I, th I thought was fascinating to hear is that the income inequality was at the time of the Great Depression was about the same as it is today. And I think that that is something that uh, Americans should What's take the note of. Between off budget and on budget. Uh, I'll come to that question in just a second. Go ahead, Jim. Uh, the the other thing is that I think that I heard Steven Fenberg say that had the banks uh, continued to lend, I think is what he was saying, um, we wouldn't have had the crisis in agriculture. And I think that um, this might be a bit wonkish. But it seems that farm practices at the time of the Great Depression were such that farmers have become more dependent upon uh, synthetic fertilizers and were tilling the soil too shallow. And that this, uh, this shallow tilling is what contributed to the, the loss of topsoil, uh, the, the dust bowl uh, of the Midwest and, and, and made farming almost almost uh, impossible at the time. And a, a related question to that is that, was the extension service, the US extension service created through uh, these this uh, depression program, the Reconstruction Finance Act to assist farmers in helping them to understand the importance of deep deep tillage so that uh, the topsoil wouldn't be blown away. That's the question I have about, about the, uh, the extension service. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I, the, the RFC, as far as I know, did not have a role in the extension service. 
But from what I understand about agriculture during the 1930s is the markets were completely saturated. There was not enough demand for the products, wheat, corn, the, the prices plummeted and uh, farmers were going bankrupt. So here's what the RFC did. It stepped in and said, we will take your produce off the markets and store it for you so that we can create uh, a demand so we can you know reduce supply and bring up the price we will make loans on those crops you give them to us to store when the prices go back up because of scarcity you can come and redeem your loan take your crops and you will even have more money to you know beyond the loan because the price has gone up because we have removed this excess from the markets that's yet another thing the RFC did that helped farmers and made money for the United States government. That was the Credit, e the credit Commodity Corporation, correct? That's correct. That's correct. Yeah. Essentially, what they were doing was they were ironing out supply uh, so that when all the wheat would come, <clears throat> time prices would collapse, they would take it off the market, store it for later until prices returned again. They would lend the farmers money on what they were bringing in. And so they could live, so they could, you know, have food to eat. And then once the prices came back up, the farmers came and got their crops. They sold them for a profit. They repaid their loans and they had money to spend. Right. And uh, Jim, I would uh, I also don't know so much about tillage and uh um, you know, farm practices. Uh, I know that we everybody's seen the Dust Bowl documentaries and that kind of thing. Uh, but one uh, thing that I would recommend for you is a movie called Kiss the Ground, which talks about the relationship between topsoil loss and uh, tillage and uh, release of uh, CO2 into the atmosphere. That's a really good um, documentary, Kiss the Ground. Mm -hmm. I would recommend that. Great. Uh, so those are great questions. But uh, a lot of the uh, I understand uh, our historian, <laughs> uh, our historian has talked about all these um, entities of the RFC that when it was closed down, sort of shifted into other parts of the government. Uh, one of them is the Credit uh, Commodity Corporation still exists today. Uh, there are also farm lending institutions that are uh, around. There are government-owned uh, financial institutions that lend. Uh, so a lot of these things that came off of the RFC, we still need them as financial institutions today. The only one we don't have is an active bank that can lend for infrastructure projects. So that's what we want to re recreate. And the Export-Import Bank was started uh, by the RFC, exactly, and it still exactly. exists, and it's also very important. And one big difference, you, you asked about the longevity of these things. Uh, all of these previous banks, uh, like the RFC, like the First Bank of the United States, the Second Bank of the United States, we've had four iterations now of these really large banks. They all had a term limit on their charter, about 20 years. And they became a political football, a big fight uh, on on entities, you know, members of Congress or presidents that didn't want them around anymore. And so they didn't renew them. Uh, this was a big, huge mistake. The lesson we learned from this history, we need a continuing permanent bank like uh, this National Infrastructure Bank will be. It has no term limit in it. Uh, just like the another government institution, the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, which was another uh, output from the Great Depression to and the RFC, <laughs> yeah, to ensure the deposits of banks, you know, so that if banks went down again, once again, people wouldn't lose all their money in the bank. Um, that entity is a permanent uh, financial institution. Similarly, this National Infrastructure Bank, as as it's currently drafted in the bill will be a permanent institution because what we, the lesson we've learned is we cannot afford to, to finance infrastructure through the budget and we need this off budget entity. Now, the question was, what's the difference between off budget and on budget? Yes. Okay, great. That's a great question. So when we have a, a budget uh, for the United States government, uh, what we do is uh, the members of Congress, the house in particular has to put forward the budget uh, it has to uh, discuss everything for the next for the coming year, uh, and the, uh, the the it, it, this budget request should uh, lay out everything that we need to spend 
to pay interest on the debt, military spending, pay for Medicare, Med, you know, Social Security, all those things we need to spend, plus the revenues that are coming in. Uh, and all of that has to be approved, tax changes, that kind of thing. Uh, and then at the end of the day, when you execute the budget, you may have enough money or not enough money. But this is the spending part. The budget is the spending part. So uh, when we run deficits, uh, we don't have enough revenue to cover the spending, then we accumulate debt. And that's where our national debt has come from. So the budget is very much approved by Congress year on year and uh, results in, if it's not covered correctly, it results in the addition of uh, national debt that we have to pay interest on. Compare that to an off-budget financial institution like the National Infrastructure Bank will be. It is a lending bank. It has its own budget. Uh, it uh, earns money uh, off of the difference between the interest on the loans it makes and the uh, deposits that it brings in to circulate and the credit and the loans and what it has to pay to its investors uh, for the uh, treasuries that they bring in. So all of that is an insulated budget. Uh, it is self-sustaining. It, it can make money for itself in the same way that the Reconstruction Finance Corporation made money for itself, had enough money left over to subsidize some grants here and there. I think overall, the RFC gave out 70% in loans and 30% in grants that it shifted through other organizations. I think that that's the correct, the correct number. Stephen can correct me. And uh, this bank will be similar. This uh, uh, National Infrastructure Bank will run on its own steam. And so the beauty of it is it doesn't require a uh, uh, anything from the federal budget. It doesn't require to go through the... We haven't even agreed on a budget for this year. We're now into fiscal year 2025. <laughs> and they punted it off. They didn't want to do it before the election. They had big fights last year over the 2024 budget. They it, they barely got through with that one. So our whole budget process is run aground. And mainly it's because there's not enough room, there's not enough money in the budget. So this bank, once it is enacted, can run on its own steam, give out its own loans, earn its own money, and uh, all of the loans will be in conformity with what's in this. There's a write-up on how it operates, how the NIB operates uh, on our webpage, if you want to go and look there. So, uh, okay, uh, Rick, Rick, could you uh, uh, give us your comment on the, the healthcare sector? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Congratulations uh, to uh, UL FECA. And uh, thank you very much, Stephen Fenberg, for joining this conversation today, uh, I'm sure it will garner a lot of attention. I'm, I'm a retired uh, public health physician, 40 years plus. I live in Bucks County. Uh, the NIB uh, knows my position on uh, supporting the bank. But let me just mention that I, I like to say that the U.S. healthcare system is at least three things, broken, immoral, and definitely economically unsustainable. Do you know that we spend four times as much on healthcare in this nation than we do on military? Now you might say, well, that's not bad, but we're not getting our money's worth. Uh, that's the important thing. Uh, compared to peer nations, uh, we spend a lot more and get a lot less. Now, my pitch to the NIB, and I'll say it again today, is that uh, what a lot, a lot of your programs are doing in the broadest sense, in the broadest definition of health is actually will improve human health across this nation. So I'll cite at least three issues. Flint, Michigan was the tip of the iceberg as far as lead in the water. So your water uh, projects are will definitely improve health. US-wide broadband is absolutely tied to human health. In order to successfully navigate the healthcare system these days, everyone needs access to the internet. Uh, low cost housing, and I can go on and on. Much of what you're doing will improve health. Um, Stephen, I wanted to uh, thank you for your smiling. You and Kamala Harris are about the only people I'm seeing these days who are smiling. And I, I think it's terrific that you have that much joy in your heart. But I'll, I'll leave it at that and just thank you for realizing that what you are doing will improve human health in this nation. 
Thank you. Thank you. I, I, I want to say something. Thank you so much for your kind comments. I appreciate that very much. And the and you make such a good point because when electricity was brought to rural America in the 1930s, it not only improved productivity, it improved human health, just as you say. People had refrigerators. Yes. That made such a huge difference in human health. Absolutely. The RFC built water systems. Everything that Alfeca mentioned that the NIB wants to do, the RFC did it. And right. that's why I think it's so important to use it as a model for today to show that the successes from the past can be used for strategies today. And Absolutely. Thank you for your comments because so much of what the RFC did improved human health, not only the economics of our nation, but also human health. So thank you for that perspective. Oh, you're welcome. We have to for complimenting or, we me have on to my smile. We have to, <laughs> uh, your smile is terrific, but we have to convince organized medicine that human health is much broader than just medicine. Right. Human health from a public health perspective is, is a huge topic and it's a lot more than just medicine, medicine yeah. versus health. Thank you very much. And I would add one more, more slogan I've heard you say, Rick, that a good paying job, it contributes to human health too. Absolutely. And all the, all the major journals are finally publishing articles on uh, the broader definition of human health. Uh, and uh, it's not just medicine. So having a good paying job and liking your job, going to work every morning and really enjoying your work is definitely correlated to better human health outcomes. Thank you for mentioning that, Alfeca. <laughs> great, great comment. Thank you very much, Rick. I appreciate it. Okay, how about Earl Stalen? Uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, I'm a very big fan of uh, Stephen's book. I've read it at least twice um, and also watched his video. Um, I also want to ask uh, Steve and uh, Alfeca, but it seems to me that our lack of having a public bank at the national level able to do all these things that uh, uh, the this bank could do is a factor that plays a big role in our current foreign policy, which in an economy led by Wall Street cannot compete with Russia, uh, which has publicly owned banks at the national level, with China, which has several large uh, publicly owned banks, only their own economy better than we're doing, but also to advance their uh, road and belt initiative to help fund countries in Asia, the Middle East, uh, Africa, and South America in ways that we cannot. And so the, the solution of Wall Street, which cannot compete with these other countries and Iran, Iran is another it, it's which is part of the uh, the BRICS um, because we can't compete. Our solution is to make war on these countries and declare them as enemies. It's a horribly failed approach to economics uh, and world problems. And this bank is a major solution to that. It would pull us out of this disastrous approach to policy. And as a last point, I want to suggest, Alfeca, you would be a marvelous director of this bank. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> That's what I'm going to answer next time somebody asks me that question. <laughs> I, I want to respond very briefly to, to what you said um, about... Um, well, go ahead. I, I'm still thinking about Alfeca as the director. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a lot of people have commented on the political economy aspect of our foreign policy. And I totally, I personally totally agree with you. And so does some of the large uh, opinion pieces in the newspapers. Uh, we have to, we have to use a different model. We cannot go around and, and keep a military spending, which is unproductive spending as far as I'm concerned, doesn't invest in our economy and, uh, and then leave, you know, and then ring out the, uh, you know, let our infrastructure crumble. And the other investment we're not making is we're not investing in our workforce and our people. Our education is slipping and um, all of this needs to be refurbished, dusted off and fixed. Um, until it is fixed within the government, the National Infrastructure Bank can take over and help to organize some of these things. So that's 
you know. I, and we can once again look at the RFC as a model of how to shift economic power from Wall Street back to Washington. And that's the way they handled the railroad crisis. The railroads were among the largest taxpayers, the largest employers, and I think half of them were bankrupt during the Great Depression. And so they needed to refinance their loans. The banks were offering to refinance their loans, but at exorbitant interest rates. So Jesse Jones would step in and say, that bank wants you, wants to make you a loan for 5%. The RFC will come in at 4% unless they're willing to come back down to a more reasonable offer. And in, just by doing those kinds of things, the RFC, I, th I really like your point, the RFC shifted financial power and economic power from Wall Street, which was completely you know, cap had captivated the rail industry. In fact, one of the conditions for an RFC loan was that the owner of a railroad, if his line was in California, had to move from New York near the Wall Street bank or back to California where his line was. Uh, but that's all to say, to your point, the RFC is yet another model for how it was able to shift economic power from Wall Street to Washington. Great. And uh, I would like, before I go on with the rest of the questions, I would like to ask Stephen one question that is sort of related to this. Could you give us some examples? I mean, today in the United States, building infrastructure is very costly, especially rail projects, um, electricity projects. Uh, there's disputes over land rights and all these other kind of things. But could you say something about how the RFC's lending operations brought and uh, led to standardization and brought the costs of construction down. Great question. And that was that's best exemplified by the construction of those enormous plants that built the tanks, the ships, the the airplanes. They were enormous, massive plants, thousands of acres, some of them, where they could, you know, put steel at one end and the other end would come out a finished engine. The way it worked, and I'm going to try to sum it up, was the different military uh, branches would say, here's what we need. They would send that to the RFC. The RFC would then craft contracts. They had a standardized contract to build plants, uh, to manufacture, let's say, airplanes. So it's all from standardization of contracts uh, that were orchestrated by the RFC with Jesse Jones, a capitalist and a businessman who understood credit, was in charge. It was all by standardizing the contracts, making requirements and saying, this is what you know is required if you want us to do these things. That's back to the lending programs during the Great Depression. They so had... They couldn't. They you you only way you could get a loan is if you were you would agree to reduce your salary to less than the president of the United States, for instance, or you moved back to your line instead of being next to your Wall Street banker. Okay. But I think even more, it was the contracts that were crafted to massively militarize industry. And did they have uh, features in them, features in them like, um, you know, standardization of machine tools or training workers you or any of the things you as bet. well? All of that yeah. stuff prices down. Yeah. I mean, the RFC basically created the machine tool industry. Right. That was one of the first things it had to do during World War II. Other, otherwise, everything would have to be handmade. So, I mean, that they when I say the RFC was comprehensive, they did everything that was necessary to militarize industry and to fill the gaps for things that weren't there. Excellent. That's great. And we can do all that again today because the- Absolutely. The giving out loans, it'll be giving it to a municipality or a government uh, entity that owns the infrastructure, but in the loan contract, it can require the the subcontractor contracting uh, stipulations uh, just along the lines that you've just described. That'd well, and just as I had made, made the uh, example of aviation, they built schools to train aviators to fly the airplanes. You know, they were always looking at how do we support workers and how do we train workers to do the, all the things I was reading recently about the electric grid and how they need to train workers to build out the grid. It's a perfect example of the aviation schools. It's all been done before and it can be done again. Super. Great. 
Okay. Oh, and I do want to say one more thing about loans, though, uh, was another thing that differentiated the RFC that separated it from banks was because they could give long term loans. And that was so essential for these massive projects. You couldn't just do a two or three year loan. They had to be 10 year low interest loans. And that was something the RFC was equipped to do that banks were either unwilling or unable to do. And uh, that's another feature today, because I understand that even the Hoover Dam loan, uh, which came from the RSC, was a 50-year loan, or it maybe was renegotiated to a 50-year loan, and it just got paid back um, a, a, a decade or so ago. So, And it came out of small increments to electricity prices on all the people that on, in the seven states that get power off of that dam. Right. Okay, how about Maud Charlie? Did I say your name right? Uh, unmute me. Oh, thank you very much. Yeah, the name is spelled correctly. Um, my name is Maud. I'm the new neighbor of Stephen. Thank you for including me, Stephen. Um, and I wanted to mention that in Germany, we do have um, an organization which is some kind of uh, bit of the Marshall Plan, and it's still working and it's um, helping the government and for ex and especially private persons who want to um, better their houses in, in, kind, in terms of in a energy efficiency or small companies to get um, yeah not not cheap loans but to 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 get them at all and they they have about uh, what did I calculate they've got 578.24 billion US dollar per year and it's still running it's there since 18 1948 thank you yeah thank uh, you. yeah I would uh, also ask Maud if you could say something I mean Germany is a, in a totally different uh, setup than what we have in the United States where we have everything is in the private sector uh, the banking sector is not investing, especially in the real sector, it's it's investing in financial instruments. But in Germany and in Europe, you have long-standing infrastructure banks, the KW... KfV. Yeah, yeah. KfV. And the Staten, I forgot, I apologize, I can't, I forgot the name of the bank, banks, but it's, it's a whole setup to make sure that you have all of the public infrastructure you need and you have all the investments and you set up your education system to stress technical jobs to the same extent that over here we stress a college education or a finance degree. So it's a, a completely different setup. And what you, the one thing that you really have that we're absolutely missing is a better rail system. Um, we have one of our other speakers always talks about you can go from Spain all the way up into East Europe on high-speed rail trains. Uh, they're just magnificent. Uh, mo most of your transportation is set up to, um, you know, for rail projects, and then your housing uh, is set up around that. So um, this really cuts down on your CO2 emissions, and uh, it's a whole different uh, approach to continuing investment in your economies. Super. Okay, go ahead, Stephen. Uh, well, I, my only response is personal. I live in the Netherlands and I don't own a car because I don't need one. You know, I use the train, the tram, the bus, I walk or a bike. And that's impossible in most parts of the United States. Yep. Correct. Super. Okay. Uh, let's see. Jim, did you have another question? I had, uh, two, yes, I have a question, uh, it occurs to me. Are state governments the highest form of government that can access uh, bank loans from the National Infrastructure Bank? Can, in other words, can federal agencies uh, or the federal government borrow money from the National Infrastructure Bank? That's one, That's my question. The other is that I think you were searching for uh, Sparkasm, Sparkasm, the the, uh, the public bank in Germany, which um, which I think the uh, public banking institute wants to emulate in terms of having state uh, state banks like uh, Bank of North Dakota. I think is what you were looking for. Anyway, 
Absolutely. So that's a great question. Um, and I'm not totally sure about uh, the answer to it. I've tried to search. For example, I've asked several times, could Amtrak, which is a government owned agency, borrow for its train projects? I've also asked, could the um, Bureau of uh, Land uh, uh, mines and land, I, I didn't say that right, uh, wh who owns a lot of the dams and levees around the country that need uh, refurbishment, could they borrow? Uh, or the Army Corps of Engineers. Uh, those are some of the agencies that um, need financing to rebuild uh, land uh, 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 entities or to build new ones like water management projects. Uh, uh, the we, what we know is that originally they did borrow to build the Hoover Dam on the whole dam system along the Colorado River. Could could we replicate that today because they need new water supplies coming in? So those are some of the entities that we want to be able to lend to. Uh, state governments would, uh, uh, of course, borrow for anything that they own. Cities and counties are the big um, um, hurdle because they own a lot of orphan roads and bridges. Uh, they haven't got the money. They need to build, rebuild schools. Uh, a lot of the um, utilities underneath of roads need working on gas lines or leaking all over the place. So this really needs a whole concerted effort to share in the borrowing, do better at urban planning, uh, fix things. You know, while we're down there digging for lead pipes, let's fix all the rest of the stuff that needs to be fixed underneath the road as well. So our infrastructure is old, crumbling. All those galvanized pipes are. We even have wooden wooden water pipes that are still around. So we have a lot of work to do. Especially our bridges are crumbling. Uh, this is a, all hands on deck. Our need is huge, and what I would emphasize is that Stephen has talked about a lot. Is this is this is a, a our need is huge because we haven't addressed it in the last seventy years, uh, and when we address it, this will have a big, huge impact on the economy as well. So, Stephen, would you like to add something? No, I, I think you've really said it all. Uh, I continue to say. The ingredient for all this is to embrace the power of good government and see it as something patriotic. That's essential because otherwise people will demean what we're doing. They'll mislabel it. And that cannot be the case. Good. Great. So, um, Don, did you have another question? Yes, yeah, just one more comment. One, you, Alfelka Mutardi, should definitely be on the board of directors of this bank. But you're too nice to be the head of it. The head of it has to be somebody that's one of the knock heads and, uh, you know, get people to do stuff. Bill Knudsen, who was president of General Motors, that took over what was called the Defense Productionist Corporation. You need a guy or a woman like that that can actually run this thing once we get it going. I got to put some more thought into this. Anyway, Yalfeka has to be on the board of directors. I agree. I second that. <laughs> and you and you mentioned Mr. Knudsen. Jesse Jones and Mr. Knudsen had a direct line to each other during World War II. Wow, I didn't know that. No wonder it worked so well. Yeah. Yeah, uh, the, the amount of coordination that's needed with the real sector, um, we, we really, corporations will really need to have a different viewpoint because right now, uh, any that are Wall Street owned, they're bu very busy sucking out profits from the corporation, paying their CEO uh, huge salaries, which have grown 2000% compared to the salaries for the average worker. They're not investing in their people. They're actually firing them. And uh, they think that, you know, putting in robots and that kind of thing will, in the long term, uh, I'm not sure that their behavior is the best for their public corporations, uh, but we, we they really need to have a, a different view of uh, today's view of in, uh, investing in America and not trying to extract profits out of America. And so that's a, that'll be a big turner. And that thing, when you look for a CEO, that's the kind of person you want to you want to find. That's my personal opinion. Okay, we've had a great discussion today. I really appreciate all of your input. Uh, we will, again, post this on our webpage. Uh, and any of you who would like to participate in the work, this is a grassroots coalition. Any of you who would like to participate in the work of the coalition to bring on new members of Congress and get support for the bill, we would really appreciate that. 
Uh, the book is Unprecedented Power. Uh, it's still on Amazon.com. So if you would like to get a copy of this book, if you haven't read it so far, you can see I use it as a reference myself. Um, mm -hmm. So um, it, it's, it's a great model for how the National Infrastructure Bank would work today. We've uh, we've used that as our model, and um, we would love your help to uh, go to your members of Congress to see if we can get them onto the bill. Uh, here's all of our information. Our website, nibcoalition.com. Uh, we have. You can always email us if you want to. If you get any, if you go out during this election period and run across your member of Congress, take along the flyer on the NIB with you to give to them, tell them to sign on to the bill. This is the only way we're going to get out of our economic woes and solve our debt problem. And uh, you can become an active member on the coalition. You can also make a donation to the uh, coalition. We, we're a very low budget uh, organization. Uh, we, we need financial assistance to run uh, webinars like this. So please make a donation or put get on there for a monthly donation. That'd be even better. Uh, but we are uh, a grassroots campaign and we're actively working and we have made a lot of progress in moving this bill forward and we would really love your help in uh, doing the same. So thank you very much for your participation today.